Okay. Hello, I'm Sven Dürr. I'm part of the Technical uh, Information and Communication Services of the University of Stuttgart. And back then, during my bachelor thesis, I evaluated an FPGA accelerator card in the context of OpenCast um, and compared it basically to normal CPU-based transcoding. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Okay, let's try it again. Um, so, um, the main motivation for this is that, especially during the pandemic, we had a very high increase in uh, um, lecture recordings. Um, as we can see, it had four times the amount of hours processed. And of course, video takes a lot of space, so it's in the interest of the services providing OpenCast to transcode the videos itself. Um, H.264 and H.265 are basically the standards that are mostly used, um, but are pretty complex thanks to the intra and inter frame perception to remove redundancies. Um, I included a small block uh, diagram of the encoding algorithm. Um, there's a lot going on, and these algorithms can basically run on software alone. Oops, on a software alone like the CPU uh, with um, X264 and X265. Um, also on um, ASICs either dedicated hardware or um, integrated in the GPUs, like Intel QuickSync Video, ha um, AMD has a solution with Video Core Next, and NVIDIA uses NVENC, and for decoding also NVDEC. Um, they all have the um, advantage that the performance is high, but they lack a bit of quality compared to the software encoders. Um, in my case, I now evaluated the uh, FPGA as well as the final solution and put it in comparison. We choose the Xilinx uh, VOU30 accelerator card, which um, takes a PCIe times 8 interface. It houses two FPGAs, both of them have four of the um, PCI lanes use a quad-core application processing unit based on RM. Um, each are equipped with four gigabyte of DDR4 memory. And as part of the program logic, they have the video codec unit, uh, unit which basically takes care of all the encoding processes um, and can take care of H.264 and H.265 videos up to level 5.2 and 5.4 on high profile. Um, Xilinx itself supports the video SDK, which comes with all necessary programs, but the pre-compiled FFMPG included in it doesn't support like the software codec. If one wants to use both on one platform, they have to compile it themselves, which is pretty straightforward, but one disadvantage of the whole setup is that it doesn't support the whole instruction set of the codec, which will come in later as well. Um, one can use the card either on-premise, on own hardware, or use AWS. They offer three different sizes for it, on pretty beefy hardware. Um, um, Depending on the sizing, you get up to eight accelerator cards. Um, the VT1 instance is mainly made for real-time transcoding for streamers, but can also be used for open-cast transcoding. I used exactly that setup for my thesis. One of the main parts of the 
um, workflow was the encoding, of course. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't house all um, instructions. Usually you would say like you use a um, constant rate factor to set a certain quality and let the encoder reach it and adjust the bit rate. But the Xilinx card doesn't support it, so we kind of had to go around that and set up a measurement which we can use to evaluate it. Um, so we just used um, fixed bit rates for each um, of the different resolutions we targeted. Um, and the main difference between the different um, encoders is now basically the video codec which is used and the um, pixel format. Technically, you could omit uh, different parts of it, like the level, and let um, X, uh, and let FFmpeg choose that for you. But we wanted to have like a comparable set with the same parameters, so we tried to fix as many steps as possible there. Also, I included a small um, configuration panel in OpenCast itself, so it can be um, selected directly there, which profile, which um, target resolution, and which encoder is getting used. Um, the video material I used for comparison is basically Big Barbani. Uh, it's a, a rendered video in Blender. A bit more complex than the usual lecture recordings, but it gives a good base level and it um, it allows a good evaluation and comparison. The results will, especially in performance, will be lower than with lecture recordings since we have a lot of more of movement in the picture. But it should not really matter because it gives still um, at yeah, a comparison. It's only 10 minutes long um, compared to a normal lecture recording with 90 minutes, it, which has for us the advantage that it gives results much faster instead of having to wait till the complete 90 minute video file is compiled, we get min and the results pretty fast, especially on lower resolutions. And we get multiple source resolutions we can use for direct uh, quality comparisons later. Um, we have two sets of video files, one's the original release with 24 frames per second, um, where we basically use the 1080p version for comparisons, and we have the 30 FPS re-release, um, and we use the um, 4K video file there for a space and converted it down basically to the 1080p version. We stick to the same group because the quality filters later on um, are, do, uh, are using frame-to-frame -frame comparisons and of course if we change the frame number there it would give different re uh, results so for the performance itself we got the results that uh, hardware encoders um, are both pretty fast for both H.264 and H.265 on average we have like 300 80% increase in performance in average. Um, if we take H.265 as comparison and for H.264 we still have like a 38% increase in performance. And they are both on the same level basically. It doesn't matter for the user if he wants to use the more complex H.265 or the H.264. Um, unlike on the software codex where there's a high discrepancy between them two with H.264 really being less complex, processing faster, and H.265 takes the longer, longest but gives the best results in the end. 
During the thesis, I used three different measurements. Um, I will present one of them here due to time. Um, we have the video multi-method assessment fusion, which is a measurement created by Netflix. Um, it basically takes multiple different measurements in consideration and fuses them together and rating basically the subjective perception of the video as a human would um, receive it. And as we can see, the hardware codecs are always giving a lower quality than the software ones, um, especially on H.264, which is always the lowest level. But H.265 is pretty comparable. And then one last point we have, which might be interesting for some people that are housing it in-house, uh, hosting it in-house, and the power consumption. We don't have actual numbers because we use the AWS web services here and we don't have access to the actual hardware. Um, so we can only make assumptions. Um, the virtualization also adds to that uh, um, multiple Multiple persons can share the same server, the same hardware itself. Um, so it gets a bit washed down as well. Um, in general, you can uh, speak that software encoders are generating a high load on the CPU and thus um, generating high power consumption. The CPU in the AWS instance is um, the Xeon rated with 210 watts for TDP, which is not actual power measurement, but um, a measurement for the heat generation during, um, during processes. And the actual power draw can be a lot higher than that. And this is for the CPU only. Sure, the, you get the other hardware requirements as well when you use the FPGA card, but the load on the CPU itself will be lower since the demanding part, the transcoding itself will run on the accelerator hardware. Um, for, Xilinx, for the Xilinx card, um, they actually specified a typical power draw of 18 to, uh, 15 to, uh, 18 to 25 watt, which is a lot lower. And if you transcode a lot of videos, in less time with less power, that's pretty good. And yeah, that's basically. Any questions? Thanks, Sven. James. James. Thank you. Uh, rather than the uh, power, what, did you work out the cost uh, per hour of rendering? Mm? So On AWS, the yes. cost? Uh, it was 30 cents per hour. For the Xeon cards. So how, how did that compare to the CP doing it in software? Oh, um, Locally, not on a EC2 instance. Actually, for AWS, I just... Um, I Run every test on it, so, um, but they don't price different if you use the accelerator or not. It's just basically this insta instance which costs 30 cents. Or, um, you can, of course, get a beefier CPU um, based instance which, which might differ from the hourly cost, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if you run your software, if you run your sort of software encoding again on a you know a standard EC2 compute node and just have a look at and work out what the cost in comparison, that would be an interesting number to add. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Everyone tired already? Yes. Oh, over there. Hold on. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Sven, for your presentation. It's very interesting to see this in FPGAs. Um, this, it, do you know if this uh, FPGA is, is like a PCI Express that you install on a computer? Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's a normal PCI Express card. Uh, it takes an X8 slot um, and shares the same lanes. Um, so it can technically be put in a normal server if you want to host it in-house. Okay, thank you so much. Um, maybe I can comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, you... The, we, we did the evaluation on, on AWS because it was available. Um, actually, you can't buy these cards in Germany. I was told by the distributor, you're not allowed to sell them in Germany. I don't know why. We wanted to get one. Um, so you actually can't buy them at the moment. I'm trying to figure out why. Um, yeah, but they're just normal cards. Mine is a, it's a side question. Maybe it's not, well, it's, it's because of the talk, but it's, it's not directly for the talk. Is anybody of you testing H265? <laughs> Olaf has a, had a question, <laughs> but he's tired, so I, I, I do for him. So, any anyone doing H265? No, 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 no. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why we actually did that. I, I was looking into H.265 and the CPU times to, to compute that would just not be feasible anymore at our place without some, some more dedicated hardware. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to go that way. I, I rechecked uh, uh, the, the Can I Use website right now and, and what I see is that Firefox is not supporting H265, and I don't find any news for that. And minor browsers in in yeah in in mobile phones are not either. So I wonder. So for me, the problem is that if I go H265, I will have to make the both encodings because to support other browsers so i i don't yeah i i don't, I don't know for that and another one is yeah just for that is that uh, we are doing dual streaming in many cases dual streaming is is pretty odd for for computers because at many times even which i took this for is one is accelerated and the other is not I wonder what ha will happen. Maybe one more comment why I also looked at the FPGAs in the first place was that you can actually, what I was expecting that would happen in the future is that with AV1, the, the codec supported by Google, that we would get some hardware support that you could put on the, the FPGA because you can basically reflash it with some new circuit so I was hoping that if we go the FPGA route, we would be able to support H.265 and AB1 in the future, if there would be a chip available. That was the idea. But the U30 at the moment only supports the H.264 and H.265. It can be the Xilinx at support there, but they are also limited to the limited amount of configurable logic on the board itself. So... Maybe. And, and yeah, but but also a reminder that maybe now is a good time to reduce the number of videos in your in your repository, which has increased in in every place. I think, if you think about re re encoding stuff towards whatever, first decrease the number of videos you have to encode and then think about what what encoding technology you choose but we we can revisit this for sure um, from adding to that Olaf says um, the only uh, use case that I can believe that 
uh, encoding to H.265 or today to AV1 because it doesn't have broad support of the browsers. It's for ar archival purposes because in the case of AV1 has a 60% of uh, efficiency in this space over H.264. Uh, so you could, like for the archive, process to AV1 and only have the engage in H.264. That's what, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay, we'll have to table it here because there's one more session. Thanks, Sven, again. And... Um,